Welcome back to Science. Let's take a look. You're listening to KTALLP FM in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm your host, Vince Guchik, and uh, with me in the studio are John Nelson and Craig Ricketts. We did a segment earlier about the habitability of the planet around Proxima Centauri B, uh, and I got into a discussion about how warm it is on that planet based on how much power that star, which is cooler than the sun, is radiating, and then how intense that is at the distance of that planet from the sun. So Craig said, hey, you got into the fourth power law for the amount of radiant energy coming from a body at a certain temperature, and we're talking about things that act uh, to radiate well at all different wavelengths, so-called black bodies, named for the inverse effect where they absorb everything at uh, very well at different wavelengths. So this uh, fourth power law has an interesting history, uh, and it also ties into one of the most perplexing failures of classical mechanics, talking about electromagnetic theory, Physicists were looking at how many ways there are to radiate energy at a given frequency, a different given wavelength energy, and it looked like there are more and more ways to do this at higher and higher energies. So there should be an infinite amount of energy coming off of any body, and that is obviously not so. Uh, Max Planck was dealing with this and he just tried something. He said, let's see if what happens if we say uh, energy doesn't come out continuously, it comes out in packets called photons. It's quantized. This was the beginning of quantum theory, which is spectacularly successful. So my friend Barty Ellison said, okay, here's Max Planck. And he says, let's make finite steps for energy to be emitted, not continuously, and voila, what happens is you get a cutoff. As you get to higher and higher energies, there's fewer and fewer abil uh, opportunities, you might say, to emit photons. So at any given temperature, when you go to higher and higher energies, shorter and shorter wavelengths, there's less energy. And then you take the whole equation that he, he derived and you can, as we say, integrate it. You basically sum over all the ways that the energy is coming out, and you end up with this fourth power law that says the total energy coming off of a body acting like a black body is proportional to the fourth power of the absolute temperature. Now, uh, as we said in the last segment, that is measured from absolute zero in whatever system you're trying to use. If you're using the metric system, that's zero degrees Kelvin, and Kelvin is 273.16 plus the number of Celsius degrees. So we're sitting here in a studio. What do you think it is? 20 degrees, John? Craig? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's about 293 Kelvin here. So uh, we can round that up. Let's say it's 300. All right. Now let's compare that to the surface of the sun, and let's round that up a little to 6,000 Kelvin. How much more energy per unit area does the sun emit? Well, the temperature is 20 times higher, so it's 20 to the fourth power, which is um, 160,000 times more. So it's pretty toasty on the sun. You, you better uh, use some pretty good sunscreen to get close. <laughs> So, Craig, um, what was the uh, item that you thought you would comment on there? Well, Vince, you did such a nice job in doing a, an analysis here for the extraterrestrial case of the, of the planet, the protoplanet, revolving around the sun at about 4.25 uh, light years away from Earth. It made me think of a terrestrial application of this fourth power law for radiation. And this was not known to those doing it at the time, but the ancient Egyptians actually made use of this fourth power law, which is a very powerful law. Uh, any two bodies at a different temperature are exchanging radiation with each other. 
And the one with the higher temperature uh, has a great advantage because of that uh, fourth power uh, exponent on the absolute temperature of that body. So it turns out that th this was this was done uh, to create a specialty for the pharaohs only, and it's documented in history. And th the delicacy that they were able to make at that time, uh, without the advantages we have today of uh, refrigeration and freezing systems for food, was they actually made ice cream. <laughs> and this was available only to the family members of the ruling family. And what they did was they would put a shallow silvered dish out uh, under the night sky and they would have a cylinder, sort of like a telescope, essentially sitting on top of it to prevent radiation, incoming radiation from the air, surrounding air from reaching this, this shallow bowl that had water in it. And they would aim this telescope-like setup uh, to the night sky, which effectively almost had a, a temperature of the four uh, Kelvin that you mentioned earlier of deep space. So you, you might have a temperature of about 300 K uh, initially, and then this silvery bowl of water would be radiating to that very low temperature of the night sky making use of the fourth power law and this would allow them to create ice which yeah. then was turned into ice cream right well i've actually done some studies about uh well, let me backtrack okay i did a lot of studies about fluxes coming off of vegetated areas like pecan orchards and i uh, i hammer on this idea in my publications that if you're going to calculate the condition of the leaves at the top of the canopy, they're seeing the cold sky. And that is a huge deficit for their energy balance. So they're colder than you would expect by quite a bit, a number of degrees. And you have to, if you want an accurate model of what the plants are doing, photosynthesis and so on, you take that into account. And I also have a, an infrared thermocouple. Are you familiar with those? Have you seen those? Yes. Yeah, okay, basically you're focusing the radiation coming from any direction onto some things called thermocouples. They'll reach a temperature uh, in a steady state according to how much radiation is coming off. Uh, and you can read the temperature. Well, if you aim one of these things somewhere around your where yourself or vegetation or something, you're going to see something around air temperature. You aim it straight up at the sky in our... Uh, skies that have very little moisture and, and are also cold because we're at elevation. And typically you're about 40 degrees Celsius colder than the air, 72 Fahrenheit. Uh, it's not all the way down to 4 Kelvin because we've got that intervening moisture, but there's not much of it. So it, that sky looks really cold. And I just read, and I don't have the finger the figures uh, in hand I have fingers in hand though <laughs> that there are people talking about using this kind of a technique they have something that uh, radiates well to space in a region of the spectrum where there aren't absorbers out there so that radiation can pass right out and you can actually make things colder than the ambient air or the ambient surfaces. They're thinking about doing this for uh, reducing the heat load uh, on buildings and so on. So this sounds really fascinating. The Egyptians didn't know the fourth power law, but they were onto something. <laughs> That's really cool. So um, let's see, where do we want to go from here? Oh, I was actually uh, at the end of the last segment talking about other topics we could go into. Um, we've already done some of these. Oh, this one would be for you, John. We can do it right now. Uh, the loss of the Mars orbiter in 1999 because of the conflict between using metric and English units. Pretty sad situation. Uh, 
you know, and they it, really, when you talk about going to Mars, they've had a lot of problems. I mean, they're, I don't know what the percentage of making it to the surface <laughs> has been, but it, it's not real great. They're getting better. But that's right. They were using uh, uh, metric one place and English uh, an, an another part of the calculation, and uh, the thing crashed because... Uh, yeah, Just I should mention that John uh, is uh, an engineer who worked on the Apollo 11 mission, so he's had direct experience with this complicated uh, operation. What I heard uh, in an article was even more fascinating. It ties into all sorts of things. Okay, why did they have two different units and not know it? And it turns out that uh, in a lot of their programming languages, they could specify in any variable a magnitude and a unit. So they could say this is, you know, 400 and this is poundles or this is 400 and this is newtons. And they decided with the limited memory that they had on these spacecraft memories, uh, uh, spacecraft, that they would just forget about that because it would double the amount of code and they didn't have much room. Uh, they'll just keep it in their heads, but two heads didn't match there. <laughs> and the other thing that's interesting about this is why did they have such small memories uh, and why do they have such small computers? And one of the big deals is radiation. So if you look at spacecraft, they don't have all of these extreme high capacity CPUs and RAMs and everything else and cache because those are very vulnerable to radiation. You get a really small volume to, to hold a bit and the cosmic ray hits and that bit's gone or it becomes something else that could be disastrous. So in the Apollo program, didn't they have ferrite core memories, which are these big, actually magnets? Yeah, very original, yeah, back in, in Apollo days, yeah. But I'm, what I'm wondering is, is that today, I wonder if their shielding are able to use uh, smaller memory and, and shield it so that they can get by, you know, with with more memory. And uh, I don't know the answer to that, but what do you think? Oh, um, well, I've got some interesting uh, observations from this friend, David Anderson, and we'll get into that right after a station break, but that's a great lead. <laughs> 